welcome to NAPOD, where we provide NA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us to be self-supporting by visiting NAPOD.xyz. Look for the donate link and drop a dollar or two in the virtual basket. If you're also an AA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Sobercast. Sobercast features AA speakers and workshops in the same format as NAPOD. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Sobercast, that's two words, on any podcast player app or go to Sobercast.com. Enjoy the podcast, and thanks for listening. I'm not a name James. Amen. I'm clean today by the grace of God in the program of Narcotics Anonymous. And welcome to Coagna 2423. Listen, one of the things that I got out that I understand very clearly when I got here was suggestions. You understand me? I came in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous off the streets with seven days clean. No detox, no rehab, no halfway house, a desire to stop using. You understand me? I'm talking about a desire to stop using, man. You understand? I sit up in the night, I detox in the rooms of narcotics and knowledge. Where I come from, we call it the front row, the critical care unit. You understand me? They say suggestions is a must when you get here. If you don't su- take suggestions, you got a rough road ahead of you. And let me tell you, I said, see, I ain't going to drag this out. I just got to get right to it. Because this is how it was given to me when I got it. I had a gentleman in that I met in a narcotics anonymous meeting when I had 12 days clean. My clean date is 10 2 and I ain't found it necessary to use since. I had 12 days clean, I was in a narcotics anonymous meeting, and my sister, who had been in this fellowship, she had about six years clean, and she asked me, she said, James, do you have a sponsor? And I told her, no, I don't have no sponsor. She pointed at a gentleman right there, right? And she said, go ask him. I went over there and I asked that gentleman, would he sponsor me? And I said, yes, sir. Will you sponsor me? He didn't say yes and he didn't say no. He gave me a suggestion right away. He told me, go get a meatless and go get a pen. When I came back to him with the meatless and the pen, I handed it to him. He put his phone number on it and he said, call me. And when I got home that night, I called him. Because see, check this out. Suggestions is very important when you come to the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. Let's talk about 90 meetings in 90 days. Check this out. I did something else besides 90 meetings in 90 days. I went home for 90 days at night. For the first time in my life, I did 90 meetings in 90 days when I got it, and I went home every night for 90 days. That's how I changed people, places, and things and stayed away from using addicts. Because see, it talks about in that first edition, our common welfare comes first. Personal recovery depends on it and use it. I got nothing in common with somebody that's using. And when I got home that night, thank God, I don't know what God plans was when I got here, but check this out. God had plans that I didn't even know about. Because see, check this out. One of the things I had when I came to losing our cops and I didn't pay no bills, but for some reason I always paid the telephone bill. You understand? And that telephone was a lifeline for me when I got here. With 12 days clean, I had to get home with a telephone. That's a very important tool right there. You understand? Because see, check this out. You ain't got to get up to go back out the door to call nobody. And I called this gentleman up, right? And he gave me some suggestions right away. He said, first thing I want you to do is I want you to get up. He asked me, did I have a basic text? I told him no. He said, when you get a basic text, give me a call. But you know, most important of all, he say, don't stop calling me till you get one. But he say, make sure you call me right away when you get a basic text. And I got it, went to the meeting. Out of about 15, 60 days, came when I got to the meeting, I had a gentleman friend of mine gave me my first basic text, and I still got it today. And when he gave it to me, I called the guy up that I asked to sponsor me. Not once did he say yes, and he said no. He gave me some suggestions to do. Right away. You see, one of the things for me, man, I never done what nobody told me to do until I got to the rooms of narcotics anonymous. I had an older guy that sponsored me my first two years and he passed away. And I, I'm grateful for him. You see, this right here 
January 2000, Coagulum was my first narcotics anonymous conviction. I had 90 days clean. And I'll thank God for the suggestions. Because see, without the suggestions, I don't think I'd have been in this narcotics anonymous conviction January of 2000. Only through the suggestions, only through the subtle commands that doing what somebody tell you to do. You see, when I got right, it wasn't all about that. We actually just said I was told to do something. See, this addict needed somebody to tell him what to do. You asking me what to do is totally different than what you telling me what to do. Because I never done nothing I was asked. I needed to be told what to do when I got here. And one of the things the gentleman did, I called him up when I got a basic text, right? And he said, what I want you to do is start reading. He told me, start reading my basic text. Who's an addict? Why are we here? What is the narcotics and honest program? But he said, go on, Father, right? And he said, when you get to page 18, I want you to stop. When you get to the bottom right there and call me up. And when I called him up, he said, I want you to get some ink pens and some writing tablets. That's what I did. See, check this out. I'm talking about somebody got me in a process of this thing, and I don't even know it. I'm just following the suggestions that was given to me by this gentleman. This gentleman sponsored me my first two years of this process, and he passed away. But he gave me some vital and something very important, man. He gave me something to hold on to when I got here. You know what I'm saying? I had a gentleman that was a no-nonsense type of guy. He told me, whatever you do, James, don't waste my motherfucking time. You understand me? He told me, he's just like that. Don't waste this time. And one of the things he did, when he gave me, I got the ink pens in the right time, he had me write on who's and that. But most important of all, he said, go to the bottom of page 18. You understand me? And check this out. I have been reading this, but he had me write on it. You understand? You know, it talks about right here on the bottom of page 18. It says right here, these are some of the questions we have asked ourselves. Are we sure we want to stop using? Do we understand that we have no control over using drugs? Do we recognize that in the long run, we didn't use drugs, drugs used us? Jails and institutions take over the management of your life at different times. Do we fully accept the fact that our every attempt to stop using or to control our using Phil, do we know that addiction changed us to, into someone that we didn't want to be? This honest, deceitful, self-will, people with eyes, and are with ourselves and our fellow manhood, do we really believe that we failed as drug users? Check this out. I started writing on these questions right here, right? When I sit down with this gentleman, we went over them, right? Never once did he told me he sponsored me, but he never said no. That was the most important thing. He never said no. And one of the things we started doing, man, I started talking with this gentleman over the phone every other night or every night after a meeting, right? And he, one of the things he taught me was very important. He said, you need to listen when you sit down in the meeting. You understand me? And see, man, the suggestion is very important. Because, see, we talk about we do 90 meetings in 90 days, but I added something to it. I went home every night for 90 days, and I lost the desire. To use. You know, I lost the desire to use. And when me and this guy, gentleman got together, right, we went over these questions right here, right? And I think we started talking and we started doing some work and I started doing some writing. Never once did he say he sponsored me, but one evening we hung out together and we went to the Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And after that meeting was over with, he took me to his house with him. And he took me to his house. He said, Take your coat off and have a seat and relax. You understand me? And we sit down at his kitchen table and he cut me a slice of cake. You know? And right then and then he put his hands in my hands and we prayed. And he told me, he said, James, I sponsor you. You know? I'm talking about doing some things different. Because see, when I first got here, man, I was on felony probation. Right? And I thank God for narcotics and knowledge. And this gentleman right here. Because see, check this out. They say honesty. That's the first part of the first step, honesty. You understand me? And when I was able to come to this convention with 90 days clean on felony probation because I was honest. See, I could not stay clean for, this, for nothing in the world. From January of 2000, January of 99 to October 2nd of 99, I gave, my, I gave a dirty urine up every Friday for 10 months straight. 
every Friday. And every Friday I went down to that guy's office and he asked me, have you been used? And I said, yeah, I'm dirty. He took my urine test and he knew it once the ever mentioned me that he violated me. Because see, after, when it got close to the end, right, I knew of some things I had to do different. You understand me? So it suggested me that I go to an anger management program. It suggested I join an outpatient group. And I did those things because I had a court date coming up, right? See, back then I had a court date coming up right then. Around October, November sometime, right? And I started getting, I started staying clean. You understand me? I started getting to the Narcotics Anonymous meetings and I started staying clean, right? And I gave up a clean urine for the first time in damn near 13 months. And when I went to this gentleman and I asked him, I said, I got a group of guys that I've been hanging around and they going to Columbus, Ohio to a convention. And I asked him, I said, is it okay if I go? He said, get back with me a week before you get ready to put y'all leave. Because he said, when you're leaving on a Friday, it was the 7th of January, 2000. And he told me, go ahead. You know, told me, go ahead on. You understand me? Because I'm talking about, man, I use every day. I live to use and use to live. I suffer for a long time before I got here. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know what to do when I got here, but I followed some suggestions, man. And see, one of the things when this guy, he told me that he was sponsoring me, man, I did anything he asked me to do for those the first six months, the first two years he sponsored me before he passed away, man. Whatever he asked me to do, man, I did it. And it saved my life. Because without this gentleman, without God, this program of Narcotics Anonymous and sponsorship, I would not be standing here. And with the suggestions, I wouldn't be standing here this afternoon. You know, one of the things, man, he, he took me places with him. You know what I'm saying? We used to ride to Batavia to the, cause he's a Vietnam veteran. And we used to ride over to Batavia, ride with him over there to meetings over there with him, right? And he told me one thing, I'm gonna tell you something right now. When we sit down in this meeting, he said, you keep your mouth shut and don't say nothing. Cause he said these, he said these guys is very serious. So I, and I sit there and I listen. You know, and I sit there and I listen, but I learn a lot. By traveling with this gentleman, man, that he sponsored me for my first two years of this process, and he gave me something. He gave me something very important, man, that I held on to every day, man. You understand me? Because I'm talking. About I had someone in my life, man, that molded me. He shaped me, man. He showed me what it is that I needed to do. You understand? I'm talking about suggestions early in this process is a very important tool to use, man. To check this out. If you don't, you got a rough road ahead of you, man. I had some guys. Back in 99 of October when I got here, right, don't even see none of them today. You know, don't see none of them. You know, I followed suggestions, man. I had some guys that was here when I got here, you know, and I, I followed them everywhere they went. Every, whatever you meet they go to, that's why I was, I showed up, man. I started making a coffee at my home group with about, about 60 days clean. I was the coffee maker. And man, that's what was important. You understand me? Guys were like, man, you make real good coffee. You know what I'm saying? I get the meeting started at noon. I get there about 10, 10 30. And I sit up. And you know, one of the things is, man, I wasn't impressed about sitting up at the table trying to secretary me when I got. Man, I should get to the meeting at 10 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. I get the coffee going. I get the literature stuff set up. I get the key tags and everything lined up. You see what I'm saying? Then the other gentleman, he's secretaries the meeting. You understand me? I set the meeting up and I break down the meeting. I did that for almost five years. You understand me? I, then after that day, I, I started secretary in the meeting. I started being a treasurer of the home group. You know what I'm saying? And they trust me with the money. And I made sure that everything got taken care of, man. They talk, they talk about the suggestions of this thing. But see, check this out, right? It talks about it in the chapter, what can I do? This is, man, this is the most least talked about chapter in the basic text. Chapter 5, what can I do? It says right, it talks about right here. Many of us feel that we cannot possibly have a happy life without drugs. We suffer from an insanity and feel that there is no escape from using. We many fear rejection from our friends if we get clean. These feelings are common. They said these feelings are common to the addict seeking recovery. 
we could be suffering from an overly sensitive ego and the most common excuses for using our loneliness, self-pity, fear, dishonesty, closed-mindedness, and unwillingness are three of our greatest enemies. Self-obsession is the core of our disease. You understand me? One of the things, man, I suffered for a long time before I got here, man. I'm talking about, man, I used to live and live to use. You understand? I had somebody, man, when I had 12 days clean, man, took me by the hand, man, and guided me, man, and showed me, man, what it is that I needed to do. He did for me what somebody did for him. And that's the importance of this program, man. Doing for you, doing for somebody what somebody did for you. Because, see, we don't just come in here, man, and learn how to do all the things that we do, that we, that we see other addicts doing. Somebody showed up. And I heard him tell a guy one time, right, he was sponsoring him, right, and I was standing next to him. We was about to leave the meeting together, right? I'm like, he, he was a rough customer now, a no-nonsense sponsor. And he told his other sponsor that he was sponsoring, right, he had more time than I had. He said, man, let me tell you something, man. He said, man, quit wasting my fucking time. Okay? I'm like, oh, man, I watched him go up one side of his attic and down the other side of his attic. I knew right then and there, man, I had the right guy. You know? You know, I knew right then and there, man, I had somebody that cared about saving my life, man. So you got to see, one of the things that I watch, man, is that you got to just be straight up with some, somebody sometimes. You just got to tell them the truth. Just see, check this out. We sit up, we, we sit around the rooms in our cottage and nine was right. We got treated like shit on the street. But when we come in here, somebody want to save our life. First thing we want to talk about is somebody hurt our feelings. Maybe your feelings need to be hurt. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes your feelings need to be hurt. You need somebody to tell you the truth, man. You understand? I've been coming to this convention since I had 90 days clean, man. And I... And I don't want to, I don't try and miss it for nothing. You know, we have a great time when I come down here, man. I'm talking about, man, check this out. I truly believe, man, that's when it really is. I started learning how to surrender, man, when I was here 90 days clean. I heard so much. But everything that my sponsor had showed me in them 90 days, man, I heard it right here in this, in this convention. They talk about the, 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 the truth, tell the truth. I'm talking about a point of freedom. When I first saw that, right, what it says, said, the first one I saw was a point of freedom where the step leads to change back in 2000. I was at this convention. I said, damn, that sounded real cool, point of freedom. I ain't know too much about what a point of freedom was with 90 days clean, but it sounded good to me. You know what I'm saying? It sounded real good to me. You know what I'm saying? It's a point of freedom. And I started getting a clear understanding about a point of freedom. Freedom from active addiction. Freedom from being a slave to a habit. Freedom from being dragged through the streets. You understand? Cause see, I come out like a old boy might say, I came in on a TWA fight, a thorough whooped ass. You know, I'm talking about freedom, man. From not, man, I'm talking about, listen, man, I'm in the line of nights, man. I'm talking about, my clean date is 10 99 right? The last day that I used, man, I got home on a Saturday night. I fell asleep and I woke up about 3 o'clock that Sunday morning. Right, I don't know what I woke up for. I had nothing in the icebox to eat. I had a can of peanut butter and a jug of ice water. And a loaf and some bread. And I ain't talking about the peanut butter you get out the grocery store. Okay, I'm talking about that peanut butter if you ain't careful to tear up a whole goddamn loaf of bread if you don't surrender. Okay, if you don't, if you don't surrender. Me and my brother, me and my mother, me and my brother, we went through plenty of slices of bread trying to get it right. You know, and one of the things happened to me, man, I woke up that morning, man, and they say, we, we always had a foxhole prayers. Man, I didn't have a prayer in me. I woke up, man, and I fell off the couch on the floor. And the first words came out of my mouth. I said, I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired of living the way I'm living. You know, today, man, I have a life worth living. You know what I'm saying? I got a 14-year-old daughter. That's an A student. You know? And it ain't so much of what I poured into her. It's just so much of me, 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 me staying clean. You understand? Because, see, that's a distraction to a kid. Going to school and got to hear other kids that your daddy's a crackhead. 
She, she ain't got the hair that I've been clean 13 years. She's 14. You know? And she ain't got to live with that stigma on her. You know what I'm saying? And we had fun together. This is the holiday season. She spent five days with me. You know, and I was packing her stuff up, getting her ready to go home. She's like, you rushing me out? Yeah, time for you to go. She said, you done spent up all my money? I ain't got no more. You know? And I, and I enjoy this, man. I enjoy coming down to this here convention. You know? And we have a wonderful time when I come down here, man. I'm talking about I had somebody, man, that poured so much in my life, man. That for the first 24 months I was here, man. Listen, man. You, you don't forget it. It's something that they talk about spiritual principles that we can use every day in our everyday life. You know, man, what he taught me and what he showed me, man, I use it to the best of my ability on a daily basis. You know, I don't take nothing lightly. You know, I take this thing serious, man. That's why a lot of days I just sit back, I relax. Like I had it told me that my second night college now was basically, he said, sit back, relax, take it easy, get a cup of coffee, because you're going to be here a while. But he said, most important of all, cool your heels. It's like, man, niggas had some good slogans around. Hey, boy, and I came up here with 90 Days Clean. I mean, they were sharing, man. Because I'm talking, about, man, that's a real beautiful thing, man, when you get a point of freedom, man. You understand me, man? You ain't got to be dragged, man. You ain't got to be, listen, man, you can go home at night. I'm talking about that was important for me, going home for 90 days in a row. Man, I never went home at night. Never. Man, I used every chance I got. You know, that was my life consistent on using, live, living, and use, man. Check this out, right? My mother stayed right across the hall from me when I, when I surrendered and stopped getting high, right? But I never once would I knock on the door and ask her for nothing to eat because I knew what I was going to get. See, I, see, man, I ain't have no type of mother, man, that babysits you. I didn't have no mother that I can go to and get money to go use. You understand me? See, I didn't have that. I didn't have nobody, man, that rescued me. Only thing rescued me is when I ever time I ever went to jail or something. You understand me? See, I didn't have no nobody I can rely on. You understand me? And that's what I truly I believe that really helped me out a hell of a lot. See, I couldn't walk across that hall and say, Can I get ten dollars? Nah, it ain't happening. See, I had one of them type of women that raised me, man. She didn't take no shorts and she didn't take and she didn't go for nothing. She told me straight up how it was. You understand me? Anytime I used to call her up, she know when I'm using somewhere I ain't got no business being. She said, you sound like you in a hole somewhere or something. You know? And she told me straight up. And she had one of them buzzers, right, when I got out of jail. i never forget, right? She let me run back and forth. And she had my money in her room underneath a little, a little thing you lay on top of your dresser, right? She had it laying up there for me, right? And she let me run back and forth, rain the buzzer. She opened up the door, and I get on the room and get my money out of it, and I take a shower, and I go back out to the races, right? When that money ran out, and I ring that buzzer, she had hit that TV channel on the channel where you can see in the hallway at on the security camera, and she just sit there. I knew she sit there just looking at me. <laughs> Ain't nothing left here, son. Ain't no need coming back. <laughs> You done ran, you done ran out of money. So, ain't no need you ringing this buzzer no more. Okay? You know, I'm talking about, man, listen, man, my father, man, was an alcoholic. You know, my father left us when we, my father left us when we were, when I was six years old. You know, I heard the gentleman last night was talking about his father, right? I can identify with that brother, the midnight speaker. My father left home in 69. And he never came back. You know, that's right after my, my oldest brother got killed. My father left home for what reasons, I don't know. I never questioned it. You understand? I can see him whenever I get ready. But like that gentleman said, when you look up, you don't see your father there. And when you're doing something, it's a hurtful feeling, man. You know? It's a hurtful feeling, man. And I can identify, you know? And I ain't going to sit here and hold this hostage. I ain't going to sit here and babble. You understand? But I think the co the committee for the opportunity, you know, to come up here and share my spirit, strength, and hope and carry the narcotics and items message.
And if we talk about in the last paragraph of that fifth edition, it says that an addict, any addict, can stop using drugs. That's the physical. Lose the desire to use. That's the, that's the mental. And find a new way to live, which is spiritual. Our message is hope. And we're all said and done, our primary purpose is to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. And I'm an addict named James. And that's all I have to give. Thanks for letting me share. Our next speaker is um, Berlinda, and we welcome you. My name is Berlinda, and I'm an addict. And uh, I'm real grateful to be here. I'm grateful for God's traveling mercies to get me here safely. Um, my topic is surrender or be dragged. And when they called me and told me this, because last year when I was here at the convention, the programming chair was like, I'm going to get you to come share at the convention next year. I'm like, yeah, right, everybody always say that. But I didn't think I was going to be here. And when she called me and told me about my topic, I was like, surrender, be dragged. I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do? And I called my sponsor up. I said, sponsor. I said, they got me sharing on this topic. She said, you know what to share. Share your experience in that area. First of all, I want to um, ask for a moment of silence so I can allow the God of my understanding to do for me what I find impossible to do for myself. Thank you. Um, I want to turn real quickly in the It Works Time Why uh, book on page 11 out of the step one. And what it reads, it says, as we work the first step, we find that surrender is not what we thought it was. In the past, we probably thought of surrender as something that only weak and curly people did. We saw that we had we saw only two choices, either keep fighting to control our using or just cave in completely and let our lives fall to pieces. We felt we were in a battle of control, uh, in a battle to control our using and that if we surrendered, the drugs would win. In recovery, we find that surrender involves letting go of our reservations about recovery and being willing to try a different approach to living. The process of surrender is extremely personal for each one of us. Only we as individuals know when we've done it. And I just want to stop right there. And uh, to me, you know, all my life, I had to fight with my sister. And... Growing up, my mother, my real mother, didn't raise me. So I was raised by somebody else. And I never really got what I wanted. It was always, um, and I'm y'all bear with me because I'm real nervous. Um, it was always a point of she got what she wanted, but I had to wait to get what I wanted. And it never really amounted to being, it's like my real mother used to come and bring some money to us every two weeks. And my money would last me for a while. But then my sister, you know, she um, would need money right away. And I went through a lot of my life back and forth. I, um, I didn't want to really be where I was. And... I left home one day. I caught myself running away. And I ran around the corner to the bar only for them to bring me back to my mother. And it took me 
a long time to surrender to the fact that I was in this home and I was stuck here. I felt as though uh, my mother didn't love me. I felt that she didn't care for me. And for a long time, when she used to whoop me and stuff, I thought that was the way that she loved me. And when I got started getting into relationships later on in life, um, it was always I thought that if you beat me, you loved me. And it took me a while to learn that I didn't have to go through that. We're talking about surrendering or being dragged. I was dragged for a long time. I was dragged in denial, self-deception. I was dragged in, um, in, in part of my life. And surrendering to me, uh, when I got in recovery, we was talking about not fighting anymore. And, um, you know, when I want to fight a situation, it's like I don't want to give into the, the part of the disease. And I'm just so nervous. Um, you know, and I grew up in a home that love was never, um, combined, if that's the correct word. And being dragged in a situation is like, you know, back in the days, the cave days, where they used to drag the women across the roads and stuff like that. I felt that I was being dragged with the disease of addiction and for a long time being caught up in the disease is like being isolated. And the fact that when I got in recovery, I practiced a lot of the things that I did in active addiction, I practiced them over in recovery because I never knew what surrender was. All I know is that I didn't want to use anymore. If I had no guidance because my family disowned me, um, you know, I, I, the relationship was gone. Um, I had nobody, so when I came in here, I felt naked. And I seen people that I used to use with in here, and I'm like, Dad, if they can do it, I can do it too. So I held on to some type of hope that I too can recover in this process. And uh, when on this, we talking about surrendering, it's like I don't want to fight. Sometimes I don't want to surrender. Let me just say that. A lot of times I don't want to surrender. I want to fight the situation. Because I'm so comfortable with doing the things that I'm used to doing that when it comes time to, to surrender, that means I got to change. I got to do something different. You know? And I don't want to do anything different. I don't want to uh, give up the fact that um, I need to work spiritual principles on a daily basis. Because a lot of times I don't want to work on But then when I get into that bind of my life and I get back into a corner that I can't get out of, I ain't got no choice but to surrender. I ain't got no choice. Because now the longer I stay clean, it becomes unbearable that the pain is greater than what I'm feeling, that I need to surrender to the fact that I don't want to do that shit no more. I don't want to do that no more. Through working the steps and coming to an understanding that it's easier to give up the fight than it is to fight. Because when I'm fighting, then... 
I'm giving in to the fact that I don't want to change. And to me, the longer I stay, I've been here um, a little over 16 years, and it's like it took me a while to understand that it's not about me, it's about who comes in after me. And I need to be there for the newcomer to let them know that they don't have to go through what I went through. But everybody's got their experience. Everybody got their strength and everybody got their hope. And that's why we come over here and we practice these principles of honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness so that we can understand that we don't have to fight. What, what's, what's there to fight? Why do I want to fight? Because I don't want to change. But then when the pain is great enough and I'm practicing those old behaviors, I'm giving in to what the disease wants me to do. Because now it ain't about to dope no more. My disease coming me the other way. Don't you know you can go out there and trick and get you some money? Trick for what? Get a job. That's how I look at it. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know... Woo! It, it feels a whole lot better. It's like a relief comes over me when I surrender. I don't go through those struggles no more. I don't want to go through those struggles no more. Um, it becomes too painful when um, I don't want to change. So it's easier to change my perception of perception of life than to change what. With the, did I say that right? It's easier to, I don't know, I can't, I know it's somewhere in the time I, uh, it's easier to change my perception of life than to change life, something like that. But now, through working the steps, I get a better understanding of what I'm looking at because it's like the steps help me to get with me. So now I got to look at me and I got to look at why I want all this attention because I didn't get it when my mother was living and I didn't get it when my stepmother was there. And now I come over here and I want attention. I want somebody to look at me because I tried this thing before and I went to jail and I did about eight months. Uh, in there and I thought I was clean I thought I could go around old people places and things only to find out it didn't work that way after about two months I picked back up and used again when I finally surrendered and I stood in front of that judge and he looked at my record and he said Miss Sessie Sessie it looks like you have a problem would you like help and before you know it I was saying yes I said where'd that come from I, it was like a guy was doing for me what I found impossible to do for myself. And it was like I went into that treatment facility and I started listening. But I still wanted what I wanted, when I wanted it, how I wanted it. But the fact of it is, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. Things wasn't going the way that I thought they supposed to be going. And I looked at my situation, and I looked at me, and I said, you know what? I need to do something different. And I think that was the first time um, that I had given up. You know, I had a, I have a son who was adopted, and he was adopted by my choice. When I got clean, um, through my using, I had to give him up, and um, I had to give him up, and um, it was hard. It was hard for me to do that, but I thought about somebody else more than I thought about myself. And when I called, when she called me up and I told her, I said, you know, I think it's best you go ahead and adopt him and that was the first decision that I had made clean that God gave me and I say that because 
I knew that I couldn't raise this child and take him from the home that he was in and put him into my home and have his life adjusted to my life when I didn't even know what I wanted. I only had about a year or so clean. So I surrendered to the fact that it was best that he go with her than it was for him to go with me. And she made a promise to me that once he get a certain age that she would tell him who his mother was. And for a lot of years when I seen them, when I ran into them, it was like he would say, Mommy, and I wanted so bad to answer him, but I couldn't. Because I wanted for her to tell him instead of me telling him. And now today, this, this child of mine has, when he found out and he asked me, he said, why did you give me up? And I said, I gave you up because I loved you. And I surrendered to that part. I surrendered in knowing the fact that my child was being raised by somebody who cared for him, even though I still loved him. But I loved him enough to let somebody else raise him until I got stable because I was a mess when I came to him. I was a true mess. I didn't know which way I was going. All I know is I didn't want to uh, uh, use drugs no more. My mother had died because of drugs, and um, the disease took her life, and I just said I didn't want to be another Jane Doe laying there with a tag on my toe because I never carried any identification with me. You know what I'm saying? So it was like when I came over in here, I started doing things about my life. I started brushing my teeth. I started taking a shower. I started up. Uh, going to meetings. I didn't have a whole lot of clothes. I had to go to the to the thrift store or to the places that gave you stuff and I went there because uh, I didn't have anybody in my life and I, I, I my aunt, um, thank God for her, helped me out until I was able to do some things on my own. And I'm grateful for her. Because she told me, she said, you know, you never come to me for any help, but I'm going to help you this one time. But if you mess up, I'm not going to help you no more. And she helped me. She did my hair. She uh, gave me money for cigarettes. She did for me what God put in her life to do for me. And that was my start. That was my start into this program. And as time went on, um, as time went on, I knew that I had to do something different about my life. And I, I, I looked for that change. It's like, how can I change? It's like, get a sponsor. I took the suggestions that they gave me. Get a sponsor. They told me to get phone numbers. I walked up to people and I said, hi, my name is Verlinda. I'm an addict. What's your name? Can I get your phone? And I started doing the things that they told me to do. They told me to do 90 meetings in 90 days, and I did that. They told me to get a sponsor and use that sponsor. I did that. They told me to uh, um, uh, don't get in a relationship for a year. I didn't listen to that part. I didn't listen to that part because I felt it, it, I'd never been alone. And I felt that I needed somebody in my life to help me. I didn't know what being alone was about. I felt that if I was going to be alone, that I was going to use. And I remember um, that we had meetings. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. We had meetings in the downtown area at Nash Trinity. And I used to use downtown near Ray Street where the meeting was. And I was scared. And they told me, it talks about in the book, I'm not responsible for my disease, but I am responsible for my recovery. And being part, being responsible for my recovery means that I need to do the necessary things. And I was scared to go downtown because I was scared I was going to run to somebody who I used to use with and he's going to walk up to me and tell me, I got that shit, let's go. And I was going to go. And I didn't want to lose my clean time. 
So I stayed away from the downtown area for at least two years so I can get some type of foundation in my life. I needed that foundation, and part of that foundation was calling my sponsor for 30 days and getting in touch with her. Um, I started calling, getting one of the numbers that I got. I used to call people because I was scared to talk to other people, but it was like I had to do something different about my life, and, and, and I, walk, I, I used to call people and say, Hi, how you doing? This is what's going on with me. And I would share with them, and then they would share with me, and that's how I started to get a connection with other people in my life. And then I would go to meetings, and I would share what I wanted to use. And I would share the feelings that's going on inside of me until it would pass. And one day, I, I don't know when it happened, how it happened, or where it happened there. All I know is about doing the things that I need to do, going to meetings, calling my sponsor, and starting to work, and starting to read my literature. Somewhere along the line, the disease, the, the obsession and compulsion to use drugs was lifted. And I woke up one day and I said, this is the part of that I need. And that was the surrender part. That's what I needed in my life. That was the beginning of my journey that was going to take me to the level where I needed to go. And on this day, I still surrender because I don't want to be dragged. I don't want to go through that pain no more. It's just too much to just go through it. I've been clean over 16 years now. It's like um, I start, I practice the principles that are embedded in the steps. I, I listen to my sponsor, you know, um, I, I, in the relationship part. It's like I didn't know how to have a good relationship because I didn't know who I was. And once I got with my sponsor and started working some steps in my life, and it was like I I, I, I called myself switching. Instead of being with a man, I started being with a woman because I thought that was going to cure me. And I was in that relationship for two years, and then she left me. And it was like, well, why even go through this? And when I stopped, I said, you know what? I'm through. I'm just going to be celibate. I ain't going to even get in no damn relationship. It's just too much fucking trouble. And when I surrendered to that part, God put somebody in my life. I said, I didn't want to really do it. I was scared. But I said, I'm going to try it anyway. And I was with this person, and he had trouble staying clean. And I think after about six months, he went back out and used again. I said, here I go again. What is it about me that I keep attracting these people that keep wanting to go back out and use? It wasn't me. It was them. And when he came in of April of 2000, April the 1st of 2000, he surrendered to the program. And then I said I was going to give it another shot. And we've been together for uh, over 13 years. I married this man. I love this man. He helped me be a better person. And I'm not putting him up on a pedestal, but I'm just talking about the thing because I didn't know how to be a woman. I didn't know how to be a friend. I didn't know how to do the things that a woman was supposed to do, but he took the time out of his life to teach me, and I thank that man today. I thank him. Now it's like I take what he gave me and I come over in here and I try to be a better uh, woman. I try to be a better wife. I try to be a better friend. I try to be a better sponsor. I try to be a better sponsee all through this program by working the steps of surrendering to the fact that I can't fight this no more. And when a disease of addiction try to come in and try to take over my life, I say to hell with you, go to hell. Because I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I don't want to do it. It's just too much. You know, it's just too much. So, um, it's just easier for me to surrender that it is to be dragged. Being dragged means, oh, I don't want to go through this no more. Oh, I don't want to do that no more. I don't want to do that. 
I want to stand up tall and be the person who I am. I don't, my sponsor has about a year and a couple of months less clean time than me, but I like the program that she works. She has a lot of peace about herself. And it talks about it in the steps. It says, if you want what we have to offer and are willing to make the effort to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. And I looked at her recovery, and I looked at my grandfather's recovery, and I said, I want what she got. And in order to get what she got, I must do what she do. And she's had struggles in her life, and, uh, you know, her husband died, and she's been going through a lot. And I've been there for her, and it's not about me calling her and dumping everything on her. It's about calling her and finding out how she's doing today. Because a sponsor, a, a sponsor sponsor relationship is a two way street. And I believe in that. I don't call my sponsor with a bunch of bull. Now, let me share this with you. <laughs> I used to call my sponsor crying all the time. And I would call her and I'd say, oh, she said, but Linda, first of all, calm down. I can't hear a word you saying. She say, stop. Breathe. And once I did that, she said, okay, now tell me what's going on. But it would take me at least five to ten minutes to stop crying because of the pain that I was going through. But then after all that, after all me sharing what I shared with her about what's going on with me, she would say, now what's your part? I said, what you mean, what's my part? I ain't got no part. It's all about him. She said, no, look at what you did. And I would have to stop and look at myself. I'd be like, I can't stand you. life, man. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. All because I want what I want what I want. But today it's not about that. I look out for people who have come behind me. I've got sponsors in my life and, and it's like I want them to have this so bad that I'm willing to do whatever it is to do. But in the sponsorship pamphlet it says we're not counselors, we're not uh uh, advisors, we're not bankers, we're not none of that, so I can't save nobody's life. I'll meet you halfway. If you get to a meeting, I'll probably take you home if you ain't got no other way, but I can't be your ride. I'm not going to uh, pick you up and take you. I can't do that, but that's part of me because sometimes I want a people, please. I want people to like me for who I am. I want people to think that I'm this perfect person, but I'm not. I brought one of my sponsors up here with me now just to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with her. You know what I'm saying? I'm grateful that she's in my life because I see the passion that she has for this program. It's the same passion that I had. And it's like, I, I love it. I love it. We were listening to CDs on the way up here, and I wanted to make sure I got here on time, so I'm doing 80 miles per hour on the highway listening to a, a Narcotics Anonymous CD. But I was thankful for it. And you know, one of the things that the CD, uh, that the lady on the CD was talking about how Narcotics Anonymous just rolls off your tongue. She said, when you're in your car by yourself, just say, Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> and I thank God for this program because this program has saved my fucking life. Who would have thought that I come in here and have almost 17 years clean? I didn't think I was going to get 24 hours, let alone 17 years clean, baby. I'm a big dog now. She. <laughs> but I still practice the principles of this program. I surrender. I get some humi I'd rather be hum uh, practice humility to get to, than be humiliated. Because it ain't fun when you've been humiliated. I've been picked on all my life. And for the first time, um, I had to stand up for myself. You know, uh, I told you about my oldest son, where my sister was uh, raising him. And uh, I used to um, 
be real vigilant because on days when I was on weekends where I was supposed to have gotten him, she would call me up and say the plans have changed and you know, I want to get real frustrated and mad, but I said, you know what? When the time comes, God's going to present it, and I'm going to have to deal with it. And I used to get real mad when people with 30 and 60 days clean get their kids back, and I ain't had my kids back, and I wanted my kids back so bad. But when I surrendered to the fact that I couldn't fight that situation no more, my sister called me up one day. I was getting out for work. She said, what you doing? I said, I'm driving. She said, I want you to pull over. I said, pull over for what? She said, just pull over. So I pulled over. And she told me, she said, Berlinda, you've done a good job. I think it's time for you to get your son back. And I couldn't do nothing but cry. I couldn't do nothing but cry because once again, once I surrendered to the fact that I couldn't fight the situation no more, God did for me what, it, what I found impossible I couldn't do for myself. I said, are you for real? She said, yeah, I think it's time. And he was like 16 years old. So here it is, I didn't know how to be a mother, and I came into the rooms, and I cried to the people, and I told them, I'm getting my son back, but I don't know what I'm doing. He didn't come with no manual. He didn't come with a manual. She didn't sit down and tell me all the likes and dislikes and, and what he liked to do and what he don't like to do and the things that he, uh, uh, and, and sit down and help him. And I had trouble in school. I don't know about y'all, but I had some issues with school, especially math. Math wasn't my biggest subject. Well, I'm talking about, uh, you know, being a parent to him and it's like, one of the things that I had to learn, this is something, my experience, I'm not saying that everybody go through this, I had to be his friend before I could be his mother. And being his friend, I had to sit down and talk with him and, 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 and explain to him that I'm here for him. But I had to realize that I've done some damage to this boy. I used to put him in the other room with a box of cereal while I went in the next room to get on my knees and I wasn't praying. And he used to watch me. I did a lot of damage to this boy. So it's like I didn't expect for him for things to be right with us. And as time went on, we used to struggle a lot. We used to argue a lot. But one of the things that I know is that through this program, I'm able to do some different things about myself. And one day he was up, we had got into it, he was upstairs, and uh, I think I had about 10 years clean. And uh, he was upstairs, and he was just uh, cussing me out. Da, 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 da. And I put the TV on mute, and I'm just listening to all this cussing that this boy is doing. And I finally stood up, and I went upstairs. I said, check this out. You are not going to keep tagging me for the things that I did 10 years ago. I've done some things differently about my life, and you're not going to keep tagging me for that. If you got a problem with me, you come in and you talk to me about it. But I ain't going to take all this cussing and fussing that you're doing. And he listened to me. He said, but mom, I'm angry. I said, let's talk about it. And we were able to sit down and make a connection and to this day, he respects me. He, he's he got a good job. But, I, you know, my husband plays a big part of that because he used to sit down with him and talk to him and find out what's going on with him. And, and when I would sit down, and I've always told my son that anytime he has a problem or a situation that he needs. And I know it's hard because he's a man and I'm a female and it's hard but sometimes for men to sit down with a female and talk to him. But I know that now he comes to me. And he don't tell me the full food of it, but he tells me what he wants me to know. And I sit down and I can help him. And we spend one-on-one -on -one time with each other. And we go out to places. He's a big kid. So, you know, we got this, he got this uh, Xbox 360 and we went to the store one day, and I said, okay, he said, Mom, pick out a game. I said, pick out a game? He said, yeah, just pick out something that we can do. So I picked my favorite show is The Price is Right. So I picked this game out, and, and every now and then I'll go down in the basement with him, and we'll play The Price is Right together. But it's like, I don't care what I need to do as long as I spend some type of time with my kids. 
And I have another son who, um, like I told you, was raised by somebody else. But the fact of it is, once he found that I was his mother, it took him five years for him to come to me. But he finally came to me, and we sat down, and we had a talk in the car. And he told me um, that he's not proud of me, that why do I have to go to meetings? I said, check this out. Meetings help me. And if I don't go to a meeting and share what's going on with me, if I don't surrender to the fact that I got a problem with drugs, then I'm in trouble. Because I can resort back to using when I stop calling my sponsor, stop doing some step work, stop doing the things that I need to do. If I stop doing all those things, I'll be back out there using it. You ain't going to never find me. Because shame and guilt would kick my butt. I got almost 17 years clear. I'm scared to go back out there and use I'd rather stay over here and face life on life's terms than go back out there and do some shit that I ain't got no business doing. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just real grateful for this program, and I'm grateful that God placed me in a place where people can listen to me and hear me share what's going on with me. My life has gotten a little bit better. I just got a new job. I've been struggling in that area, but that's a whole new situation. But I'm working in the, I'm going to be working in the treatment facility with women. It's like I, I tried restaurants. I tried uh, nursing. I tried all those things. And I took care of my mother for seven years. That's another thing. Um, and I thought that was my field, but I got tired of changing uh, poopy diapers and stuff like that. So I said I had to get out of that field. And I called a spot, I called a friend of mine who's sitting in this room and I, and I, I, I talked to her and she shared her experience with me and she shared how I was struggling in the beginning, but I can do this. And so I start, I, I went and I put the application in and two, uh, three, four days later they called me for an interview and I had the interview and then the, they, they waited till after the holidays and then they, um, they called me back and they said they asked me was I interested in the job and I said yes I was and now I'm going to be starting this place. It takes about 30 days because they got to do an FBI background check. I said baby you can piss me. Take my fingerprints anytime. I ain't got no felonies on my record. I ain't no shame in my game. That stuff I did 16, 17 years ago. I thank God for this program and I thank God for y'all and thanks for allowing me to share. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please help us improve our ranking so others can find us by putting a review on Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast index. Napot is ad-free thanks to the folks supporting the show with a dollar or more per month. If you enjoy listening, you can join them by going to napot.xyz and looking for the donate link. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.